Hello. In this video, we're going to talk about gating for a known number of objects. In single object tracking, we saw that gating can be used to reduce the number of data association possibilities. And the same thing holds when we have n objects. We saw earlier that in n object tracking, we have a very high number of possible data association. And uh, just like in single object tracking, it would be good if we had a simple way to reject or disregard data associations that we think are very unlikely. So in other words, data associations that are very improbable. In this video, we will show that by generalizing gating to n objects, we can drastically reduce the number of data associations. We can lower the computational burden of the tracking algorithm, and we can also partition the data association problem into smaller subproblems, such that each subproblem has fewer objects and fewer detections. And the fewer objects and detections, the fewer the valid data associations are. And it then follows that dealing with the data associations becomes computationally cheaper. The basic idea when we have n objects is the same as when we had a single object. We form a gate around each predicted measurement, and then we consider only detections within the gate. And by doing so, we can often see a drastic reduction in the number of associations. And we will show examples of this in this video. And just like in single object tracking, if the object densities are Gaussian, we consider ellipsoidal gating. There are multiple different ways in which we can do the gating. However, given that Gaussian object densities are common in object tracking, we're going to focus on ellipsoidal gating. Let's start by reminding ourselves how ellipsoidal gating for Gaussian object densities is defined. The ellipsoidal gating distance for detection J and object I under hypothesis H is denoted D and is defined as the residual transpose times the inverse innovation covariance times the residual. Here, the residual, which is sometimes also called the innovation, is the difference between the detection J and the predicted detection Z hat for object I. So we have a gating threshold G, and this corresponds to some gate probability PG. The relationship between G and PG is the same in n object tracking as it is in single object tracking, and we do not repeat it here. For an hypothesis H, if the gating distance is smaller than or equal to the gate G, the detection J is considered as a possible detection from object I. And if the distance is larger than G, then the possible association of detection J and object I is ruled out for this hypothesis. We can compare the gating to the log likelihood of the association that we used in the cost matrix when we formulated the data association as an assignment problem. The log likelihood is reproduced here, and we can see that the gating distance actually occurs in this expression. We have negative one half times the gating distance. So it follows that the larger the distance is, the smaller the log likelihood is. And since we're interested in finding data associations that have large sums of log likelihoods, it makes sense to reject associations that correspond to small log likelihoods. And the ellipsoidal gating allows us to do precisely this. So if a detection J falls outside the gate of an object I for some hypothesis H, then the corresponding log likelihood is set to equal negative infinity which is an approximation of the logarithm of likelihood zero. So let's have a look at a gating example. We have a 2D scenario, so the detections are 2D vectors. And on the right here, we have illustrated 15 example detections as red squares. Now, assume that there are six objects. The corresponding predicted measurements, Z hat, are illustrated on the right as blue circles. For 15 detections and 6 objects, there are more than 6 million valid data associations. The matrix with log likelihood is shown on the bottom left here. And note that we formulated data association as an assignment problem. The cost matrix is the negative of the matrix shown here. The color scale shown ranges from blue, which corresponds to low likelihood, and to red, which corresponds to high likelihood. So associations that are not allowed in other words, that have been set equal to negative infinity are white. And if you want to, you could pause the video here and verify that the longer the distance is between the detection and the predicted detection in the top right image, the lower the log likelihood is in the bottom left image. If we draw the ellipsoidal gates centered at the corresponding predicted detections, we see that for each object, some detections are inside the gate 
and other detections are outside the gate. For any detection that is outside the gate, we set the log likelihood to negative infinity. And this is illustrated at the bottom right. We see that several of the elements in the matrix are now negative infinity. And if we were to use these log likelihoods to solve an optimal assignment problem, then any association that associates to a detection outside a gate would have a cost equal to infinity. In the top right image, we have also drawn lines between each predicted detection and the detections that fall inside the gate. And by following these lines, we see that three clusters or groups of objects and detections have formed, and we can use this to lower the computational cost of dealing with the data association by doing something that is called grouping by gating. For this example, we have three separate groups of detections and predicted detections. And the basic idea in grouping by gating is to use the gating to group the detections and objects into smaller groups. And the motivation for doing this is that handling the data association for each group is computationally cheaper than handling the data association for all detections and all objects at the same time. So in the example, we have six objects, 15 detections, and therefore more than 6 million valid associations. In the first group, we have one object and two detections. And the log likelihood matrix for this group is given by extracting the relevant rows and columns from the matrix with all objects and detections. So here we have object one and detections one and 12. And then we also need the element that corresponds to misdetection. And this gives us a log likelihood matrix with one row, three columns. And for this, we have three valid associations. In the second group, we have two objects and four measurements. The log likelihood matrix for the group is obtained in the same way. We extract the relevant rows and columns, and now we have two rows, six columns, and that gives us 21 valid associations for the group. And uh, for the third group in this example, we have three objects, six detections, and there are 229 valid associations. So by doing grouping by gating, we have reduced the number of valid associations to 3 times 21 times 229, which equals 14,427. And this is several orders of magnitude smaller than 6.3 million. And actually, if we consider the gating in each group, in other words, that for each group, there are some associations for which we have set the log likelihood to negative infinity, then we get 3 times 11 times 41, which is equal to 1,353 valid associations. And this is another order of magnitude smaller. So this example clearly shows us that the gating can help us to drastically reduce the number of valid associations. To summarize, gating for n objects allows us to disregard unlikely data associations, and it follows that we can reduce the number of hypotheses in the posterior n object density. When the object densities are Gaussian, ellipsoidal gates are a natural choice. Finally, we want to point out that the gating threshold, or equivalently, the gating probability, must be chosen carefully. If the gate is too small, we will actually reject associations whose probability is not negligible. And if the gate is too large, we will not reject so many associations, and the computational savings will not be as large. So what the best choice of G and PG are does not have a simple answer. These are tuning parameters in object tracking, and they have to be adapted such that the tracking algorithm has good enough performance and also a reasonable computational cost.